we move into the third reading comprehension passage of the Sam Cat. The passage is about the author's fondness for books. So let's read the passage. What concerns me about the literary apocalypse that everybody now expects is not chiefly the books themselves, but the bookshelf. So author draws attention to the bookshelf. My fear is for the eclectic personal collections that we bookish people assemble over the course of our lives, as well as for their grander public step siblings. I fear for our memory theatres. Okay, so the author talks about the process of collection of books, not only for ourselves, maybe for the next generation. There was a time when I thought I could do without much of one, much of a bookshelf, much of a library, much of a memory theatre. As a student in college and graduate school, moving from room to room virtually every year, desire to keep my possessions down to what we could be stuffed into a Toyota Corolla, overwhelmed the reptilian instinct to collect. So basically, I had this particular habit of keeping my possessions to a minimum such that I could pack them into a car. That minimum would be my possessions. That in itself became a pleasurable asceticism. All right. So the word pleasurable asceticism means you're giving up all the luxuries of life. You're not collecting a lot of stuff. So the second paragraph continues over here. It suited my budget and so often accompanies renunciation, renunciation habit of giving up. I came to love the forbidden objects, the books more and more. I learned to bind and sew my own, to cut the pages, to print, illustrate, letterpress them. Exactly because space was so limited, I could spend an entire afternoon at a bookstore wondering over which book to purchase and I would only purchase one. So after browsing through a lot of books, I would not buy many of them, I would just buy one. Because of this pleasurable asceticism, tendency to renounce or give up. Mainly during that time, my bookshelf was a rotating amalgam of whatever my heart desired from the library. And these were really good university libraries with miles of shelves and easy access to interlibrary loan. All right. So that time I got introduced to this interlibrary loan and I would get whatever books I wanted from the library. Next, he talks about his journey in life. He moves on. But eventually I moved on from the plenty of universities to a string of New York apartments. My little library came with me. It was finally just me and my bookshelf. So I had no possessions. I just had my bookshelf with me. At first, it wasn't even a shelf at all, but piles of books scattered around the room, on the floor, as orderly as I could manage, and as I as they did get before tumbling. The collection I had was a good one, but so much was missing. I was in New York to write and to think, and I would find myself turning to those stacks in desperation for a connection a memory or the loosest association. What suddenly became more evident were the absences, the missing books I could hazily remember having read and digested, yet which, which would need referring to again. They had turned into phantom limbs. Having at last found a stable place to live, one with wooden shells mounted on the walls, I shed the old asceticism. So the author was moving some places he had access to libraries and he came into New York wherein there were no libraries, right? So he had his own bookshelf. Now he is shedding the old asceticism. So he began the process of reassembly. Review copies that came in the mail have helped and I balance out their novelty with trips to the dustier corners of bookshelves and antique stores. But just as I have begun holding on to books, the technology of paper and print drifts into obsolescence with only unfulfilled techno-corporate promises to replace them. The point here is, isn't to be steampunk. I'll take my library in any form, so long as it will never abandon me again. Something very basic is at stake. So up till the penultimate paragraph, the author has discussed his journey in life and his relations to books. The last paragraph goes back in the past. Francis Yates' classic The Art of Memory takes us back to the Greeks who held memory to be the plumbing of one's soul, a vital tether between the sensory world and the eternal forms. They knew that misomine, memory's personification was by Zeus, the mother of all the muses. So some philosophy bit over here. The Greeks and then the Romans created imaginary edifices 
by which they could carry entire speeches, uh, speeches, taxonomies and epics in their heads. By the medieval period, this tradition was expressed in Dante's Circle of Hell and Aquinas' placement of memory within the cardinal virtue of prudence. As Renaissance polymaths drew from classical and esoteric sources, they designed and even physically built more elaborate theatres of memory. So we had theatre of memory in the first para. So now again, there's a reference to elaborate theatres of memory. In place of an audience, the 16th century memory theatre of so-and-so presented to its stage an array of images, symbols and archetypes that amounted to a microcosm of the cosmos. Standing before it, a person could lose the kinds of forgetfulness and access the mind's resources unrestrained. Whoever is admitted as a spectator reported Erasmus, having heard about the theatre from a correspondent of his, will be able to discourse on any subject no less fluently than Cicero. Shakespeare's Globe Theatre Yates controversially argued was designed in this way to help the actors remember their lines. Francis Bacon reportedly had a private memory theatre in his home, with painted glass depicting several figures of beast, bird and flower. In those millennia between the advent of knowledge, worth clinging to, and the invention of the written word, the Western mind had a desperate obsession with memory, or one could say a sensible concern. So it's a very long paragraph. The summary of this paragraph is there in the last line. The Western world had a desperate obsession with memory or one could say a sensible concern. Then there is a blank after that. So this is what the passage is all about. A very long passage. The initial part of the passage talks about the author's journey through life and how he has carried books along with him, became a collector of books and added to his collection of books. Last paragraph talks about the importance of the obsession of memory as far as people of certain societies were concerned. The first question in this passage, question 10. From the passage, it can be inferred that the author views bookshelves in houses and libraries as. Now, the reference to bookshelf is there in the first paragraph. He says that what concerns me about the literary apocalypse that everyone now expects is not the books, but the bookshelf. My fear is for the eclectic personal collections that we bookish people assemble over the course of our lives, as well as for the grander public step siblings. I fear for our memory theatres. So there is a reference to memory theatres in this paragraph. There is a reference to memory theatres in the last paragraph of the passage. Now the closest connection to memory theatres is what has been given in choice B, storehouses of memory. So the author views bookshelves in houses, libraries and other places as storehouses of memories or as memory theatres. None of the other choices come close to memory theatres. Information banks is not a memory theatre. Collection of the greatest intellect is not a memory theater. It, ha it has to be a storehouse of memory, not just pure information, not just something which is related to the intellect. So choice B is the perfect answer. Choice C says objects of nostalgia. Now the author does seem to seep into nostalgia when he refers to the past in the last paragraph. But the main reason for comparing bookshelves in houses and libraries is not to treat them as objects of nostalgia. Alright, so choice C is not the correct answer to the question. Correct answer to the question is memory theatre or storehouses of memory. Second question, question number 11. The passage collected by the author after finding a stable place to live consisted of. Now I have to be very careful over here because many of the choices are in the passage. They are all related to different time periods of the author's life. Now choice A, largely unfashionable theology, seductive philosophies and the author's prized bestsellers. This is not before, this is not when he found a stable place to live. This was when he had come to New York and there were piles of books surrounding his house. So it was finally just me and my bookshelf. At first it wasn't even a shelf, right? The collection I had was a good one, largely unfashionable theology, seductive philosophies, etc. Now this is before he had found a place to live. So choice is not the correct answer to the question. In the next paragraph, after the New York story, the author says, Having at last found a stable place to live, one with wooden shelves mounted on the walls, not just books piled one over the other on the floor, he had moved into a place where there were wooden shelves on the walls. He shed the old asceticism, became, began the process of reassembly. Right? 
So review copies that came in the mail. So he ordered maybe from different places by mail. He balanced out their novelty with trips to the dustier corners of bookshops and antique stores. He began holding on to books, the technology, etc., etc. So we can say he had a collection of latest books as well as old ones. He had his own old library. He also added to the collection. So choice B is the correct answer to the question. Choice C and D are not specific to the author in the passage. Correct answer to question number 11 is choice B. Third question in the passage, question 12. It refers to the last paragraph of the passage. What does the author try to do in the last paragraph? The last paragraph ends by saying the Western mind had a desperate obsession with memory or one could say a sensible concern. So this obsession of memory has been given in choice B. Point out how man has been obsessed with preserving memory since the early era of civilization. None of the other choices refer to memory. Indeed, there is a word memory, but the choice has proven it. The word prove makes it wrong. In choice C, it refers incorrectly to persons of great intellect. There's no uh, focus on personalities or people with great intellect. So C is not the answer. The best answer to the question is choice B. A says highlight the importance the Greeks and the Romans attached to knowledge. Yes, but that's not the main focus of the last paragraph of the passage. Correct answer to the question is choice B. The fourth question in the passage, question 13. Asceticism mentioned in the passage refers to. Now over here in the second paragraph, there is a reference to asceticism. He says, the desire to keep my possessions down to what, co what could be stuffed into a Toyota Corolla or car overwhelmed the reptilian instinct to collect. That became a pleasurable asceticism and it suited my budget. So this is a key word over here, suited my budget. So when Choice says the art of buying low priced editions of books, there can be a suiting of budget in that case. So asceticism most likely refers to choice A. B says the art of arranging the books neatly. That is not what asceticism means. Asceticism means renouncing, giving up. Art of pruning the number of books to suit the space. It is not to suit the space. D, the art of renouncing pleasurable objects. Your books has not been referred to. Objects is a very, very wide domain. Correct answer to the question is A. Pleasurable asceticism. The art of buying low priced edition of books. This reference is again there in the para 6. Having at last found a place to live, he shed the old asceticism and began the process of reassembly. Review copies that came in the mail have helped and I balance out their novelty with trips to the stores. So he goes to the shows, uh, stores to buy books as well as he orders them from different places. So the art of buying low priced edition of books is what the author refers to asceticism in the passage. The last question in this passage is the paragraph completion question asked within a reading comprehension passage. Which sentence will best complete the last sentence of the last part of the passage? The penultimate line of the passage says, the Western mind had a desperate obsession with memory or one could say a sensible concern. So this connection is given over here. The art of memory made possible the health of one's soul, the obsession of one's culture and the means of reaching God. This can connect with the penultimate sentence when in the last paragraph, as we know, is referring to a lot of people's references to an obsession of the past. So choice A is the best connection to the penultimate sentence of the passage. Choices B, C and D are little out of scope. Okay, In choice C, there is a reference to democratic society must ensure that its books are held democratically, slightly out of connection with the penultimate sentence. Even among these wonders now available to us, all having remains no less a preparation for loss, slightly negative cannot end the passage. The art of memory made possible is what will connect with the penultimate line of the uh, uh, last paragraph and therefore choice is the answer to the question.